Okay, so uh, uh, this morning, uh, my colleague Paolo used something called Menti. It's a way to interact with uh, what's happening. So if you want to uh, sign on, go to menti.com with code 786609. And let me just check the Wi-Fi is working. So refresh is occurring. It's a good sign. Okay, so menti.com, code 786609, and I'll bring it up later. Okay, well, first of all, I'm delighted to be back here at WordCamp Europe because really in all the word camps I've been to, it's got to be my favorite because it has such diversity of thinking. And uh, I've told everyone, you got to go to word camp Europe uh, because it's so different. Uh, also in the US, I went to word camp Miami, which is another amazing experience. Um, I consider an amazing experience something where different kinds of people come together because when different kinds of people come together, things get really interesting. Like uh, Paolo shared this morning about how, you know, uh, when he joined Automatic, he was one of the key Europeans. And he's someone who keyed me off to asking the question, how do I make sure there's time zone inclusivity? So the more kinds of people you have, the more kinds of constraints you have, but here's the problem. The problem is it's a problem. Do you know what I mean? It's like, ah, oh, it's kind of like an extra friction. Like, I have to do things differently. And we tend to not like to do things that are different. Why is that, you think? Because it's change. It's extra work. So we always don't want to do extra work. And what happens when you don't push yourself to the limit? You don't grow. So I'd like to point out that any time we bring in different kinds of thinking, we produce new kinds of knowledge, but it is our tendency to not want to because it takes extra effort, okay? So, um, and I like to not like show full screen because I like to control, I'm a little control freak, so pardon me, but I want to give you some updates on design. So the first thing is for those of you who have a relationship to design, Design usually looks like this. Do you know these jeans with holes in them? Who has children? Come on, raise your hand. All right. All right. Do your children like this kind of jeans? Yes. Why? Right? You're like, why? It's broken. You know? Usually you wait for it to get broken, but you're going to pay for it to be broken? Okay. That is a kind of design. Like, why is this kind of jeans more expensive than not broken jeans? Right? doesn't make any sense. It's because it's connecting to a common fashion uh, trend. The fashion trend determines what is acceptable, and fashion keeps changing. So if you want to think about fashion, uh, there's a great fashion designer named Ray Kawakubo, who has a brand called Comme des Garçons. And this was a show she had in New York recently. And if you look at this, you're like, who's going to wear that? Right? Maybe some of you will wear it. It's okay. It's, it's very expensive. But it's like, who's going to wear that? It's because design tries to push the envelope of what is acceptable. And sometimes you find new things. And that's why things like Gutenberg are so important, because they test the limits of what we think is okay. But without stretching, there is no change. Some of you may know about the Gutenberg uh, logo. That was designed by uh, Christelle Rossignol, who's on the design team that I get to lead at Automatic. And her first versions were very simple, and I asked for something amazing. And so she produced this, which everyone said, but that's not a logo. But that's the point. Everyone is using it. Everyone can feel it. It feels different. Design pushes you to think differently. Um, you may know if you have, this is my favorite shirt, if you go over here, on the back, there is a Wapu smiling. We all know Wapu. Who loves Wapu? Raise your hand. Wapu, come on. There we go. See that? Now, someone said, why did you take Wapu's face off? I wasn't trying to be mean. Uh, do you know the uh, Cheshire cat, the cat that goes invisible and just kind of smiles? So it's a kind of a cultural reference to that kind of Alice in Wonderland feeling of Wapu. Some of you may know the WordPress.org shirt. It's wrong. It isn't this way. Why is it this way? 
Well, when it's this way, it forces you to be interactive. Someone who comes up to you says, what did that say? And they're trying to think harder. So design can do that. I know also when I uh, pushed out a different design for hats uh, this year, uh, there was some anger from people. I'm not sure if you know that there's people online. Do you know there's people who get angry online? Do you know this? Do you know that people react to things? You know this, right? You can feel it. So uh, what I did is I asked to take Wapu and make the Wapu silhouette. And this got many people angry that I had destroyed Wapu. But in reality, uh, if you talk to the creator of the Wapu uh, character uh, in Japan, she's so happy because Wapu is being reinterpreted. So note that reinterpretation, like the seasons, when things change, you have life. But if everything is not changing, that is what we call death. So you will see things changing because I'm trying to find a way to connect this amazing community to more groups. Because the larger the community, the more diverse the community, as this group understands really well, it's what makes it strong and it makes it interesting. Now, um, also this person uh, is joining me. Uh, her name is Alexis Lloyd. She led the research and development team at the New York Times. And so she was at the cutting edge of anything involving voice technologies, anything involving Internet of Things. And she's just joined me, and I want to invite you all to invite her to the WordCamp universe because she wants to know what she can do to bring her skill set, which is a very interesting skill set, to help to grow this amazing community. Uh, also, this is uh, still under construction, so I, I like to show things uh, ahead of time. I think Matt says that's a good idea, so no one gets surprised. Um, I asked Matt about this, uh, they, like a, about a month ago, maybe two months ago, I wonder why there is no design award. You know how there's like this, uh, like an Apple design award for well-designed apps and things like that? Uh, and so what I'm going to try to do by the end of this year is to launch an automatic design award that is able to point out great user experience in the plugin ecosystem, in the theme ecosystem, and to point out different groups that are trying to push experience. Why does this matter? Why does experience matter? It's because so many people can now use things like, have you heard of something called Instagram? Maybe, you heard of Instagram? And things like that that have a very high experience bar because so much more money has been invested in them and we see it all the time and we know what good looks like. So I will be trying and go ahead and send me things, lob me your feelings about this, but I'm gonna to try to gather as many great examples of user experience in the WordPress ecosystem to help us all ask questions about why is this good? because that's going to be where the design is going to change. Now, the problem with design, as I have diagnosed it, uh, in not just the WordPress world, but in the technology world in general, is that most design is shallow design. What shallow design means is uh, uh, you'll be an engineer, developer, you've got an idea. You're going to make it, Ah, it doesn't really work. You're gonna keep fixing it, it doesn't really work. And you're really making it, making it, and making it, oh my gosh, it's still crashing and crashing and crashing and like, kind of works. Okay, now make it work. Ah, it finally works. And by this time, you're too tired to make it usable. Anyone know this? Come on, you know this, you're nodding. It happens all the time. I'm a software developer by training. When I switch into developer mode, I am too tired to make it feel good. I know what that's like, you get tired. So inevitably what happens, in most cases, is you make the technology work, and you're too tired to improve the design. So what do you do? You either don't design it, or you spray design off. Do you know what spraying design means? It means trying really hard to make it 
look not bad. You'll go to awesome font awesome. You'll put icons all over it. You'll make it different colors. You'll spray it again, and you hope it smells good. But uh, who cooks in here? Who, is anybody, any cooks? This is Europe. Come on, right? Some cook. Every chef knows that you cannot make good food unless you choose the right ingredients and you choose the right tools and you know how to present it. It's uh, understood, the world chef world. Because making food, cooking, is t generally easier than writing code, right? It's just different. So, shallow design is design sprayed at the end. Deep design is something different. And deep design, as uh, we've been trying to articulate it recently, is not like a epiphany or a rocket science. Uh, it's four things. It's finding the problem, discovering, finding the problem. It's then trying to figure out how to address that problem. You have to have a hypothesis. And then you're going to ship it finally. Ah, I finally finished it. Did it. And then after you shipped it, you kind of have to go and see what happened. You have to listen and look, right? So who has shipped something before? Raise your hand. Okay. Who has enjoyed seeing what happens when you ship it? Like, oh, no one's there. <laughs> like, very few people raise their hand because it's painful. It's painful to see what happens, right? So, four things discover, hypothesize, deliver, and listen. The problem is that, generally speaking, when we make software, we love shipping, we love delivering. Ah, doesn't it feel so good? Pull request done, someone improves it. I see Sonia smiling, like, ah, I did it, right? No one gives you points for thinking of the problem. No one gives you points for finding the analysis. Everyone gives you points when you ship. No one gives you points if you go and listen to see what happened. All the glory is on planet shipping, right? So that's a problem is you stay on planet shipping, deliver, and you spray on the design, and you hope it'll work. This is a classical development cycle that used to be OK, because in a time in the world where nobody made software, it was easy, because there was no good things out there. There was nothing to compare against. So if the technology worked, wow. And it's also got a two buttons on it. Fantastic. It was a happy time. Who remembers the happy time where you didn't have to design anything at all? Raise your hand. Come on. Remember that? Thank you. You would just ship it. It's like, are you happy, right? I gave it to you. It works. And you mic drop. Right? It was a happy time. But it isn't the time anymore. So for that reason, it's important in deep design to spend time working on listening to what has happened and to spend time going to real people, real customers, and discovering their problem. It seems very obvious, but because we love to ship, we forget who it's for, we don't discover the problem, and we don't listen to what's happening because we're too tired on, on, on when we deliver. Now, another thing that is really hard is to develop a hypothesis. Uh, who, um, so, uh, I don't know, I think I told you this last time, but uh, for most of my life, I was a developer, software type person, consultant, whatever, and people would always tell me, John, you're creative, so don't worry about the money. We'll worry about the money. You just create. And so the first time someone told me that, I said, oh, thank you. I'm just gonna go back and create, right? But by the fifth time someone told me this, I thought I should be worried because shouldn't I worry about the money? And so I got my MBA as a hobby to understand money and understand how things work in that world. And the thing I learned is how important it is to factor in business market thinking when you make something. 
Because well, often when we make something, we make it because we believe it, but we don't know if anyone needs it or anyone will pay for it. And so another part missing in this kind of deep design that's needed is strong understanding of business principles. So this kind of design, deep design, is very hard. And you might ask, who is good at deep design? One of the best companies in the world is Apple. So how many of you own an Apple laptop? Raise your hand. OK. So remember, if I asked that 10 years ago, nobody would raise their hand. <laughs> I got my ThinkPad. Don't take my ThinkPad. You know, the, Mac is, the MacBooks are everywhere. Uh, one of the genius ideas of the MacBook is what's called the unibody. If you look closely at the Macintosh, the, the MacBook, there's no seams. There's no screws. There's very little, you can see very little seams because it's carved out of one piece of aluminum. Also, because it's aluminum, it has a problem. Aluminum is not porous. So when they had to make a microphone to go inside a MacBook, they had to poke holes. It is not easy to drill holes in aluminum. So what Apple did is Apple secured the largest control of, number one, aluminum in Australia. Number two, they controlled all these special laser machines that could cut a perforated hole to make the microphone thing. If you look closely, it's little dots. And also, they they nailed down all the CNC milling machines that can mill the aluminum. So it was very smart business thinking that enabled them to, first of all, control the design being created, and also to reduce cost, and also it prevented every other computer company from easily making an aluminum laptop for a long time. So if you remember, there were not many aluminum laptops Recently, there are more, but when it came out, completely controlled. That is deep design. Another example uh, that you all know in Europe, in America, it's not as known. How many of you have seen this chair? Raise your hand. Come on. Oh, yeah. See? see every, all, you, we've all seen this chair. This chair is one of the most amazing chairs in the history of design. Why is that? It's because... This is, it's, because, it's called Thonet. It's not Thonet, it's Thonet. Uh, it's a Thonet number 14 chair. Uh, over 50 million sold since the mid 1800s. Uh, a key factor in why the Thonet chair succeeded is because in the mid 1800s, the ability to bend wood was difficult. And so the Thonet company patented the way to bend birch wood. And they also designed the chair to be put together, to be assembled. So you could put 36 Thonet chairs in a one meter cube box. Now, think of the, think of the late 1800s. There was no FedEx, right? If you want to ship 36 chairs, it was going to be a gigantic thing, right? But imagine uh, the only supplier of a chair that was assembled, 36 in one meter cube, beautiful chair. Also, the Thonet chair is unique because if you sit in it, over time, it gets a little more loose. It gets more comfortable over time. It also stacks and hugely profitable for Thonet. Now, I think of WordPress, not as a business case, but example of this same kind of radical thinking that enabled a simple software project to be owned by the entire community and adopted over the entire world. That is one of the great design outcomes of our century. Now, however, that may seem like blah, blah, blah. So I wanted an example. I wanted to ask uh, uh, Sonia over there, Sonia, and my friend Haj. Can you come on up to the stage here? OK. Now, I wanted to. I'm going to make this work by my camera, but the, the, um, this isn't working. Apple TV doesn't work. So I was going to have a camera. That the the, the uh, Wi-Fi isn't working. Thank you for joining me on stage here. Okay, so I have, a, I have an experiment. OK, 
Okay. Let's see. Let me give this to you. Okay. This is too hot over here. Okay. So, first of all, applause for the, the people coming on up. Thank you. Okay. So, in Hodge's hand, maybe you can hold in your palm. There we go. In Hodge's hand, he has something called, uh, he has a T Forte tea bag. In Sonia's hand, palm up, there we go. She has a Genmai Cha green tea from Yamamoto. Okay, so first of all, uh, Sonia, I want you to open the tea bag and pull the tea out. Yeah, okay. Okay, all right, all right. So, so come over here. So what was, the, how did that feel? It was a little hard because it was stuck to the top, but yeah. otherwise, pretty usual. Crisp, clean. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, crisp and clean. No, nothing out of the ordinary. No. It worked. Yes. Functional. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sonia. Everyone, thanks, Sonia. All right. Okay. Thank you. Indeed, this is a tea bag. Surprise. Tea is in the tea bag. Okay. Now, let's go over to Haj here. Haj, Haj, you have a tea forte bag. Okay, so pull the tea out. And what Hodge is doing is Hodge is unfolding the tea bag. He just broke it, but that's okay. Um, it's okay. Again, example of design problem. Uh, but when you open it up, what happens is it, it has gold foil inside. And so it has a kind of reveal. It has a reveal moment of like, whoa, expensive tea. Uh, and it has this moment of either someone breaks it, true, or someone sees it as a strange thing in there. And what happens is uh, this tea infuser is, is designed to stand on its own. And why is that important? I'll show you in a second. It's important because uh, the tea can first of all sit over the edge and also it sits flat in the teacup. So it's easy to be removed as well. So it's a kind of a full system idea. And so it's the same tea, right? But the experience is different. Now, Hodge, let's assume you didn't break the, the, the leaf off. <laughs> How, well, what was the tea experience like? It was a very smooth experience. No. I mean, it was, <laughs> I mean, it was interesting because when I opened it up and I saw the gold, just the perceived value of it just seemed just a little bit different. So. Next time, I'll probably be a little more careful when I'm pulling that's it right, out. That's right. Okay. You, you can have the tea. You can have the tea too. You can trade too. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, this that that this, that the 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 tea bag that Haj opened was much harder to design. Uh, there were probably failures like that. Haj is pretty strong, um, but uh, probably the people they tested it with was a little I mean, dainty people like me. Um, but it's an example of a, an entire system of tea that was created to create an entire experience around what is just tea. Now, why is it important? It's important because it's an analogy for the world we live in today. So today, every, everyone can get software for either free open source or free I'll spy on you, right? Uh, in the old days, you had to pay for all your software. But now you can get access to any kind of software that does anything. And so, in essence, it's like tea. So the way to increase the value of that core service is through having an experience. And the experience is something that is intangible, but it's desirable. Um, who has an iPhone X in this audience? iPhone X, right? You paid a lot of money for it. It's because you wanted that extra experience. Now, you would say that's bad. You can say like, well, that's terrible because the iPhone X costs, at least in the United States, over $1,000. So it's elitist, it's a bad thing. But in reality, once design is defined at the high end, it changes everything else. So everyone copies what is better. So the iPhone X, different, uh, different parts of it will be copied and the ones that are affordable will exist because of the design. Now, um, okay, 
So I want to go to over here. Can you go to menti.com? And those of you who are here, uh, menti.com 786609. Okay, let's see here. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you for coming. Wow, 55 people already. It's very fast here in Europe. Okay, lots of hearts. Okay, so uh, first word question. When you think of the word design, what word comes to mind? When you think of design, what do you think of? Uh, solution, aesthetic, form, art, money, product, experience, beauty, fancy, planning. It's all these things. And I want to note that all the words will be different because design is about something you feel. Something you feel is something very hard to say or put into words. Um, who's been to the doctor recently and you're still okay? Who, who's been to the doctor recently and like it was already, there we go. You went to the doctor. The doctor, what is your name? Hey, Luca? The doctor asked you like, hey Luca, or, how are you feeling? And it's hard to explain how it feels. It's like, oh, I don't feel good, or it's over here, but I don't know where. Or, and so anything involving feeling is hard to express as words. So design is a feeling word, and that's what it has so many definitions. And often art lives at the center, which is the worst thing possible. Do you know why? It's because art is something that is designed so nobody can understand. That means good art. If you go to art, an art gallery and you're like, I don't really understand what happened. That's good art. Because art is about the enigma. So design at the core is a word. It's very hard to understand. But just remember, it's all about feeling. And it's a lot about function too. I, see, I saw the word security as well. So it covers so much. And that's why it's a powerful word when you use the full range. If you use in the word design, just the part that's about polish, I often hear like, can you polish this? People think design is about polishing it, making it shinier. If you use just that bit of design, it doesn't use the entire diversity of the word design. Okay. Do you like Serbia? Yeah, I like Serbia, it's fun. Okay. Uh, this one I'm pulling, I'm taking, I'm taking a shortcut from Paolo because um, uh, <laughs> you already did what I was going to do. So I just screen capped Paolo's work. Uh, I learned that most people here, in, here are from Serbia. Hello. Uh, but people are from different places as well. Okay, look at that. Wow. See, that's same, similar. Similar. Someone's from, the, someone's from the country of yes. That's a good one. That's very positive. Yes, person. I like you. Okay, Netherlands strong, strong. Okay. Whoa, my gosh, there's so many people in this room. Yeah, oh my gosh, I think it represents Ecuador. Okay, Montenegro, all right, okay. Whew. Okay, someone's from the country strong, yes. Very good. Okay, now, uh, and also, Powell already did this. What is your native language? Um, and I asked a similar question. Uh, he asked, which languages do you speak? I ask, what is your native language? Um, and you'll see why I'm asking you this uh, in a second. But for some people, English is their native language. Some people, I, I met Stuart, who had an amazing spelling of a Stuart, and I was like, wow, that is so cool. So again, all these discoveries when you leave, uh, what, you, what you know all the time. Okay, so uh, definitely English, but there's all kinds of languages that are native in here. And you can be native in something, and you can be really good at speaking the other language, too. I understand that fully. Okay. Oh, great. Um, but uh, last year when I was here at WordCamp Europe, I was so moved by a talk, I can't remember who gave it, but how difficult it is to speak in English if it isn't your native tongue. Um, it was a really great talk that kind of made me think about how it makes you feel. And you should, you should think it should feel like easy, 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 but there it is. It's, it's scary. Uh, it's stressful. Uh, someone says sexy. So, uh, Self-conscious. Complicated. Shy. Not funny. Uh, okay. Proud. Yeehaw. Uh, clumsy. There's alcohol too. So I'm not sure if that's after or before. 
Um, but it's an example of how generally the biggest word you see is scary. Because if it isn't something you're good at and you're doing it in front of people, it naturally makes you feel a little bad. Now, and I thought it was a great analogy for how we all need to think about what is it like when someone feels different. So ca can you imagine? Uh, uh, can you, let's see. Um, let's see. The person with the van. What does your shirt say? Van Ons. So what is, your, what is your language? Dutch. Dutch. So you speak Dutch. So let's say you took Japanese one, and then you were sent on a business trip to speak in Japanese for the first time in front of 500 people. Might you feel scary a little bit? Maybe not. A little. A little. Say a little. So I want to point out that doing something different feels hard, okay, generally speaking. Okay. So when you think about, when you think about how you feel different, have you ever felt different than other people around you in a professional setting? Have you ever felt different? You can be, feel different in many ways. You may think like, no, I've never felt different. I'm always with the people I'm most comfortable with. So I see there's a, a small group that hasn't felt that way, but it's a large group that has felt different because we can all feel different. And you can imagine for the 138 people down here, 140 growing, all of them, when they're in that situation, it feels a bit scary. It feels difficult. And the reason why I want to bring it up is this thing. I've been involved in the technology industry for a long time, uh, since like the 80s. Think 10 minutes, got it. You're good. Um, so if you are someone who uses the pronouns he, him, how often do you find yourself in a business meeting where the majority likely identifies as he, him? So let's see this. So it looks like over half it happens often. For roughly 15%, it's always. For a small group, it's never. Um, but roughly, it's occasionally, it happens a lot. OK, thank you for that data. It's really important. So what that says is people who identify with he, him, see that there's a lot of he, him around them. So if you use the pronouns they, them, in this case, for those who identify with they, them, how do you feel when you're in situations where the majority is he, him in a technology business setting? How often does it happen? And again, in this case, it, it happens often. It happens often. And why does it happen often? It's because the technology industry had an accident in the 70s where it defined itself as a tool utility device primarily for the he, him category. And it shut out other categories in doing so. And in doing so, what happened is it created kind of imbalance because one thing I've noticed is if you use the pronouns she, her, how often do you find yourself in meetings where the majority is likely he, him? Um, what I've found is generally speaking, it makes it very difficult, awkward, uh, hard to understand, but easy to understand if you remember that thing where if you're talking with people who are different than yourself, it, it creates a kind of extra pressure on you. And if that pressure uh, is, in this case, 80% uh, of the time, it makes it harder. And so why do I bring this up? I bring it up because it's a case where inclusive design becomes so powerful. Because uh, who, who is a boss of more than 10 people? Raise your hand. Well, some more than 10 people, right? So if you have like 10 people, and let's say we use the UN statistics of uh, roughly uh, uh, half men, half women, in this case, use that gender for a second. Um, 
you want to use the entire team. But if you don't use the entire team, you're not getting the highest value from your team. And when you think about the way these things are set up today, it's hard to get the value from those who feel the most different. You can apply this to English-speaking companies as well. Anything you want to apply it to, it's a really powerful thing to consider. And in doing so, you will end up making better products because you're making them for more people. Okay. Let me go back here now. Okay. So there's another kind of situation happening right now which you all do not feel because you're in the population that is highly computer skilled. Um, the statistics are fascinating that you are probably in the less than 5% of the world that understands computers at the level that you do. That means there's a 95% of the world that doesn't understand these things that we take for granted. And so I point this out because every time we can think of who feels uncomfortable and think of how do we involve them, engage them, we're able to actually bring in more people to a design that's more relevant to everyone. Okay. Now, why is it important? I didn't mean to bring up AI to scare you. But if you look at the potential of recent machine intelligence advances, it is quite extraordinary. In the 1980s, when I was at MIT, I was an undergraduate, and I would hang out at the MIT Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, AI. So I've been in this AI world for a long time. But I got to tell you, in the last four years, it has changed dramatically. So everything that we ever thought was impossible just six years ago is becoming possible. Uh, in the year 2013, 2012, speech recognition rates went from one in four errors, 25%, to under 8%. It changed from 25%, it held for so long, error rates. It went under 8%, just in one year. So this thing is happening now, and what's happening because of it, most jobs, as we know it, involved in the cognitive world are going to change. And when we think about why it's changing, it's changing because the large systems out there, cloud-based systems, can use data to get patterns because they're, they're statistically meaningful now. Um, and there was research by Princeton University. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard of Google Translate. Um, Google Translate, uh, the researchers pointed out that when you go to Google Translate and you translate from Turkish to English, he is a doctor, she is a nurse, it translates to he, it, he is a doctor, he is a nurse. It translates into he is a doctor, she is a nurse. So it uses biased data to form assumptions. And that's, a, that's an issue. And why do I think it's relevant to this entire community? Because this community is so human. Like I've been to so many word camps. There's just so many people out there we're like, this is something where humanity and technology are coming together. And I just want to invite you to all think of how we're going to stay ahead of that. And it's about activating vision, being open to change, finding new practices, bringing in new people into this amazing ecosystem. And again, I hope you welcome Alexis when she starts coming into this world to experience what I have which is something extraordinary. And I really want to thank Paolo for pulling me into this uh, a while ago and discovering it with you. So that's it. Thank you, and I'll answer your questions online in a blog post. Thank you. All done.